I welcome everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that our faithfulness in coming, despite all the challenges on the way, that God will reward everyone in Jesus' name. If you're expecting a reward for the good thing God is helping you to do, say good day, amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name because of the faithfulness of your people. Thank you for the great work of grace you've done in every heart. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the service of everyone, the faithfulness of everyone, the commitment of everyone, you will reward abundantly in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you speak to every heart tonight. And whatever you want to speak to us, and whatever we're hearing, the grace to be obedient, grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I'm reading from Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34, and I'm reading from verse 31, Job, chapter 34, verse 31, surely it is meet to be said unto the Lord, it is right to say unto the Lord, it's appropriate to say unto the Lord, it is fitting to say unto the Lord, I have borne chastisement. I will offend no more. I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Let's read verse 32 together. That which I see not, Teach thou me, if I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Let me hear your voice. Now, one, two, three, go. Amen. As we look at the chapters of Job that we have already studied, in our search the scripture today you will see that there were things job did not know we knew that before things he didn't see the foundation of the problem the basis of the problem the background of the problem the origin of the problem the source of the problem the personality behind his problem he didn't see and as we have looked at the chapters today, chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7, is French Eliphaz. And as we read other chapters, all the other friends, there were three of them, another one, a younger person, came later. All of them put together. There were things they didn't know. There were things they didn't see. And they judged and they spoke and they preached and they counseled and they tried to convince Job about what he was going through and the decision he ought to make and yet all that they said in ignorance they didn't understand and it so happens like that in the life of almost everyone the things that happen to us the decisions we take and the direction in which we go and what we tell other people, how we counsel other people, how we attempt to comfort other people. Many things we don't see. Let's come back to this. Chapter 34, verse 32. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, in the things I said, in the things I did, in the decisions I made, 
in the counseling I gave and in the authority you try to manifest if I have done iniquity I will do no more I pray that Lord will make every one of us sincere in all that we are learning today and be obedient to his word in Jesus name tonight I'm looking at the message for the leaders the powerful and painful effects of friends on the ministry you're a minister you're a child of God you're a preacher you're a pastor and something might be happening in your life and the people you lean on the people you depend on the friends ministerial friends their friends family friends their friends intimate friends their friends that will take out time like the friends of job they took out time more than one week more than one month they stayed permanently with him they forsook their jobs they left everything behind and they came to Job. The three of them together, obviously, they had his interest at heart. And yet, as you look at the time they spent with him, and you look at everything they said, and you look at the impact of that on Job, you will see that their comfort their comportment, their conduct, their counseling, and the compelling things they said actually didn't help Job. And that couldn't help anybody. The powerful and painful effects of friends on the ministry. Look at chapter 4. Job chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. Then in life as the terminate and Saddam said, If we try, if we are saved to commune with thee, will thou be grieved? But who can withhold themselves from speaking? Job, we want to talk to you. We came for that purpose. If we try to commune with you, communicate with you, and if we pass some ideas unto you, will you be offended? Will you be grieved? Will you be unhappy? Look at chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. In chapter 5, verse 1, call now. If there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints will thou turn? That's the life as he's still talking. And he's saying, We'll see your condition. And we're seeing what you are going through. Call now. And check up from any saint, from anywhere, at any time, in any generation, and tell them what you are going through. Can you turn to anyone that has gone through what you are going through and yet is a saint? And then he gave his opinion what he called comfort, what he called counseling. And at the end of that chapter 5, look at verse 27. Lo, this we have searched it. So it is. Hear it. And know thou it for thy good. That's the authority of a life as. He said, Job, don't claim to have any knowledge of your own now. Hear what we're telling you. Job, don't give an answer to what we're telling you. Here is the final truth. We've searched it out. We've read a lot. We've consulted a lot. And what we're telling you, Job, is with final authority. Look at a man like that. And yet, he misunderstood everything. 
Lo, this, we, not just me. If I were to make a mistake as an individual, I would know I'm an individual. But we, your friends, were searched everything out. And so it is. There is no doubt about anything we have said. Know it for yourself and for your good. Let's look at what God said about this man that is speaking so authoritatively for the final word and the final stamp of knowledge. Look at chapter 42. I'm reading from verse 7. Chapter 42, reading from verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to, tell me, Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. See the final conclusion of what God said concerning the man that spoke so firmly and so authoritatively and told Job, don't even think that you're looking for any other excuse to contradict what we're telling you. We told you the absolute and the final word. We searched it out. Know it for your good. And God said, Eliphaz, I'm angry with you. My wrath is upon you. You have not spoken the things that are right concerning me as we are talking to Job. The powerful, painful effects of friends on the ministry, on your ministry, on your profession, on your family, on the projects you have, on the decision you are making, you allow friends to come in and they talk with authority and they can ruin your life. They can ruin your ministry. Job's friends came to comfort him, but they all ended up criticizing him and condemning him. They misunderstood his condition. They misunderstood providence and they misinterpreted the scriptures and misapplied the scriptures. Friends can be true or false. There are faithful friends and there are false friends. There are friends that will lighten your body. There are friends that will make your load heavier to carry. Job's friends weakened his confidence. He said, don't claim to be righteous. Don't claim to be holy. Check up. Look at history. Look at other people. As something like this ever happened to a righteous man, they weakened his confidence. They increased his body until he was very near the grave and he said, what am I living for? There's nobody that understands me and everybody thinks not only that I'm a sinner, I'm a criminal. They increased his body. They criticized his message, his response as Eliphaz spoke in chapters five, 4 and 5. Job replied in chapter 6 and he appealed to God in chapter 7. All that is said, another friend took over in chapter 8 to say, Job, you are not hearing words. Job, you are not listening. Job, a life has just told you. You didn't listen. I will talk to you. And so he spoke again. 
And Job replied and said, Your comforters and physicians of no value. Then another one took him up again and spoke. All they wanted to do was to discredit his understanding, criticize his message. They destroyed his faith. Don't say that you believe in God. Don't say that you are following after the word of God. They destroyed his faith in God. They denied his love. They said, as you read all the other chapters, you have not helped the widows. You have not helped the poor. You have not helped anybody. Do you love anyone? No, you don't love anyone. They denied his love. They dismissed his hope. The hope of living with God. Oh, they said, no, no, a person like you cannot live with God. God is holy. In fact, the angels are not pure in his sight. Not to talk of a rotten man like you. They destroyed and they dismissed his hope of getting to heaven. They ruined other people's trust in him. Until Job cried out, all my familiar friends are gone. And the people that knew me before, these people, what they are saying about me, nobody believes me anymore. They believe them. And so they ruined others' trust in him. Had not God intervened, at the time he intervened, they would have negatively affected his eternal destiny. That's the reason why, as you come tonight and we look at what we're looking at, you understand that friends, ministerial friends who do not have an insight into what you might be going through, they can ruin everything about your progress and about your future. God give us understanding. I thought you will say, Amen. Amen. The powerful, painful effects of friends on your ministry. Point number one, the danger of unlearned interpreters in the ministry. Unlearned interpreters in the ministry. You know what the friends came to do? They came to interpret. We heard what happened to you. We we'll see the way you feel. We understand what you are going through. Can we give you some help? Can we interpret what's happening to you? You don't understand, Job, but we'll make you understand. Interpreters. And yet, they were unlearned interpreters. Let's look at Job again, chapter 4, verse 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If we are say, that means if we try, if we endeavor to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But you can withhold himself from speaking. Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened weak hands. Thy words have upholding him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it is come upon thee, and thou faintest. It touches thee, and thou art troubled. Chapter 5, from verse 1. You've been a counselor, uh huh. It's easy to counsel. You've been a preacher, uh huh. It's easy to preach. You've been a comforter, uh huh. It's easy to comfort. See, now it is happening to you, and you are fainting. For somebody who came to comfort, what kind of language is that? Chapter 5, verse 1. Call now. If there be any that will answer thee, Call now, if there be any, if there be any reasonable person that will answer you, if there be any righteous person that will answer, call, call any of your friends. 
and call now if there be anyone that knows how deep rooted you are in sin and they're disappointed about your life call and see if anybody will answer you or to which of the saints will thou turn for all killers the foolish man the man came to comfort and now he's telling us and telling you the foolish man and wrath is killing the foolish man. Envy slays the silly one. He's calling Job foolish. He's calling Job silly. I have seen the foolish taking root. And sudden, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. I was watching you as your farm was expanding. I was watching you as your cattle were increasing. I was watching you as your servants were on the increase. And I saw you taking root. And I wondered, this foolish man is going to take root and increase, but suddenly I caused his habitation. His children are far from safety. You know, Job lost all his children. And this is what a friend, so-called, this is what a friend has come to say. This is the conclusion of a friend that says he's a friend to Job and see how painful this will be. His children are far from safety and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them whose harvest the hungry eateth up. Those Sabians that came and all those people that got rid of his farm. If this man is saying, the life has is saying, look at the foolish man. He was taking root. And all those strangers came and they ate up the harvest. And take it each even out of the sons. And the robber swallows up their substance. That's all this comforter could say. And after he said everything he said, he now comes to verse 27. Lo, this, we have searched it out. So it is. Hear it, and know thou it for thy good. I'm going to read chapter 42 once again. As Eliphaz spoke, and his words could swallow up anybody. And then he spoke with a note of authority and assurance. You know, the people that come, they want to correct you. They know that they know that you are wrong. They are sure 100% you must be wrong. They come in with the opinion, here is the absolute truth. And yet, in the sight of God, they are wrong. God will preserve us. Chapter 42, verse 7. And it came, and it was so, that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the things that are right. You spoke as if you've gone to a seminary that had 100% truth. You spoke as if you are the greatest and the highest theologians that can never go wrong. Theology means that you are studying about God. Theo, that's God. And theology, you're studying about God. And you're spoken about me as if you have the final truth. And yet, you have not spoken that which is right according to my servant Job. Let's come back to Job chapter 4. In Job chapter 4, Eliphaz is now going to bring in the name of God. It's going to bring in visions and dreams. It's going to bring in a voice from on high. It's going to bring in even the involvement of his spirit in what he was saying. 
is going to bring in his knowledge of angels is going to bring in judgment is going to appeal to history he appealed to everything you can think about to buttress his message and to buttress what he was saying unto job look at chapter 4 of job verse 12 now a sin was secretly brought to me and my ear received a little thereof is claiming spiritual is claiming that this is not just secular knowledge is claiming that he has this extra sensitive extraordinary knowledge of god in verse 13 in the in thoughts from visions of the night vision it says job listen i'm not talking to you ordinarily that's what Elijah said i'm bringing knowledge from heaven i'm bringing knowledge from vision the visions of the night when deep sleep falls on men fear came upon me trembling which made all my bones to shake then a spirit passed before my face the air of my flesh stood up it stood still and i could not discern the form thereof an image a personality was before my eyes there was silence and i heard a voice saying shall mortal man be more just than god shall a man be more pure than his maker behold he put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly how much less in them that dwell in houses of clay whose foundation in the is in the dust which are crushed before the moths that's how he tried to buttress try to strengthen and try to emphasize the message that he brought look at chapter 7 here are the words of Job now, poor man, poor minister, poor preacher, isolated, all alone, and everybody thinks it's wrong, all the friends think it's wrong, and they are bringing vision, and they are bringing dream, and they are bringing revelation. Look at Job chapter 7, reading here from verse 13. In verse 13, when I say, my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifies me through visions. He said, I thought your friends will comfort me. I thought your friends will understand. You know my life. All these lies you are telling me about me. Where did it come from? I thought you'll comfort me. And when I thought I have some peace and some ease, then you terrify me with vision and you make me tremble by the dreams you say you have. That was what happened unto him. And for those of us who are in the ministry, there are people that are very quick of talking about vision. They say, I'm coming to you, and I know your situation, and I know your, you know, you know, I know your desire, and I know your consecration. But you know, this it even surprised me. A vision came to me, a dream came to me, and it's about you. And then they begin to tell the vision just to weaken you, just to knock you. And just to make you feel that you are wrong in every decision you have made. You are wrong in every commitment you make. And you are wrong in every pursuit you have. Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 14. 
Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. Eliphaz prophesied lies in the name of God. Eliphaz told visions lies in the name of God. I sent them not. Job, I didn't send a life first. I didn't give him dream. I didn't give him vision. Wherever he saw the vision, he said the spirit came upon him. Don't accept that. Don't leave your position of certainty. It says, I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither speak unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, a sin of naught and the deceit of their heart. And the deceit of their heart in our nation here, Nigeria, and in our continent, Africa, black people like vision. And whenever they have any problem, they have any challenge, instead of going to the Word of God and see the promises in the Word of God and see the assurance in the Word of God and see the effect of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, uh -uh, they will not go to the Bible. They're looking for a prophet with a vision. They're looking for a woman with a vision. They're looking for a visionary man or woman that will tell them what they want to hear and they will tell you things that will shake your faith and things that will destroy even your confidence in the Lord. Rest for the word of God. I said you rest for the word of God. Now the end of the year is about coming. And in our nation here, and I guess in other nations in Africa, the prophets to show that we are called of God and to show that we are the people of God, to show that we're closely related with the Lord. You know, people, preachers will prophesy, pastors will prophesy, evangelists will prophesy, prophets will prophesy, everybody will be prophesying, and they will come to us, they say, others are prophesying, what do you prophesy? And I tell them, all the prophecies they gave all these many years is deception. And they prophesy in December, they prophesy in January. By the time you come to the end of January and the end of February, all those prophecies are false. They look at the trend in politics. They look at the trend. They read the newspapers. We all read the newspapers. They watch television and they, they listen to the radio and they see the trend of things. And from the trend of things up in the country, they begin to prophesy, prophesy, prophesy. And it's all a lie. The New Testament doesn't give us that understanding that you know in our country or in your country, prophesy, 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 go into all the world and tell the people about their sin and call them to repentance. But the church at large has deviated from that and a life, a life first is coming and bringing prophecy, a life first is coming and relating vision and everything is false. The Lord deliver us in Jesus' name. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. We can say that for many of the people that are professing, whoever they are, either they are from Pentecostal churches or they are from regular churches or they are from any other kind of church, we have seen all over the years that people just want to reel out and say out whatever and they attribute that to God. And God says, I've not spoken through them and I've not spoken to them. 
if God has not spoken to Elifaz and is sitting down in your house and talking and talking and talking, mentioning God, mentioning vision, mentioning angels, mentioning this and that, why are you listening to that kind of thing? Go back to your Bible. And I pray the word of God will be your stay and the stability and the foundation of your life in Jesus' name. If you don't say amen, I will say amen. amen. Let's look at Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 1. Job chapter 22. We're reading from verse 1. Then Eliphaz he spoke in chapters 4 and 5. And Job replied and said, Even though you say you're speaking with the word of final authority, I don't accept. It's not true. What we're saying about God, what we're saying about me, and the directives you are giving and the counseling you are giving it false. Thank God for Job. I say thank God for Job. And thank God for your GS. I say thank God for your GS. Since deeper life started, you'll be surprised how many people have come to me. And you'll be surprised the things they say. I could tell you quite a lot of things, but let me read the scriptures to you. But thank God I wasn't swept away. You will not be swept away. Like father, like children, you will stand on the word of God in Jesus' name. And listen to me. At the beginning of the ministry, and since the ministry has been coming on, there has not been any member of Deeper Life, any minister in Deeper Life, that will force their opinion on me, that will force their idea on me, that will come like a lifers and will say, yes, we know you are the Jesus. Yes, we know you are the pastor. But this is what we want you to do. And that is what has kept deeper life until now. I hear from God. I read the Bible. I know the way to go. I know the way the church ought to go. And I pray you will not be an Elifaz in Jesus' name. The Lord has led us up to this point and is giving us a ministry and he has directed us this is the way to go. There might be challenges. There might be difficulties. But we will keep to the word of God until the final day in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 1. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable to God as he that he is wise, may be profitable to himself. Eliphaz, we can be profitable unto God. Eliphaz was asking Job, your righteousness, your holiness, your stand, your understanding, your commitment. Can you be profitable to God? Jesus said he will tell us on that final day, well done, good and faithful, profitable servant. You'll be profitable. Verse 3, is it any pleasure to the Almighty at that thou art righteous? Of course. Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Of course. Will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will he enter with thee into judgment? Is it not thy wickedness? Is not thy wickedness great? And thine iniquities infinite? Look at the man. He was so sure. And God said unto Satan, Have you seen my servant Job? 
that there's none like him on the earth a man that is choice evil that shows evil a man that is perfect in all his ways and now your life has a sin don't you know that your wickedness is great and your iniquity is infinite for thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught that's a lie and stripped the naked of their clothing that's that's not true thou hast given has not given water to the weary to drink Eliphaz, that's not true. You are telling lies on Job. And thou hast withholding bread from the hungry. That's not true. But as for the mighty man, he arch the earth, and the honorable man dwell in it. Thou hast sent widows away empty. That's not true, Eliphaz. The arms of the fatherless have not broken. That's not true. Therefore, snares are round about thee, and sudden fear troubles thee. So you understand, you must be careful of the friends you have. Let's come to Ezekiel chapter 13. Verse 22, Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22. It says in verse 22, Because with lies have ye made the heart of the righteous sad. That's what Eliphaz was doing. With his lies, he made the heart of righteous Job sad, whom I have not made sad and strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life let's come to point number two point number two the defense of unconquerable ministers though in misery job was in pain job was in misery Job was in a great problem. Job was in a kind of web around him. He could not unravel. He could not unveil. He could not ease himself out. And yet, that man was unconquerable. You'll be unconquerable. He was unbeatable. You'll be unbeatable. And he was unstoppable. You will be unstoppable. Whatever happens, whatever does not happen, whatever the sickness, whatever the pain, the Lord will arise for you. All the pain, all the problem, all the injury, all the scandal, all the slander will not continue forever. Unconquerable he was, even though he was in misery, you'll be unconquerable. Okay, I will be unconquerable. And let's come to Job. I'm reading from chapter 6. Job, chapter 6, look at verse 1. But Job answered and said, he wasn't confused, but Job answered and said, you know, there are people who want to tell them that kind of terrifying vision and you tell them what you want to say, and you say it authoritatively, they tremble, they lose their ground, and they will not be able to contain themselves, and they cannot talk anymore. Nothing will take your voice away. Nothing will take your confidence away. Look at verse 6. It says, Can that which is on suffering be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg that things that my soul refuse to touch are as my sorrowful meat? It was accepting, uh, that's a problem. 
It was accepting. Uh, there was sickness. It was accepting. Uh, there was pain. Uh, it was accepting. There was misery. But all the same. Uh, look at verse 10. Verse 10. Uh, it tells Eliphaz. And it tells us in verse 10. Uh, then uh, shall I yet have comfort. Yea. I will harden myself in sorrow. I will harden my mind against sorrow. I will harden my system against sickness. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. Eliphaz, say what you want to say. Eliphaz, tell all the lies you want to tell. But I can assure you of this. In all the mystery, in all the challenges, in all the problem, I have not hidden the word of God. And I keep on believing on the word of God. Chapter 23, Job. Chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 8. Behold, I go forward, but it's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. I understand this problem. I cannot even communicate with him. And I cannot touch him. And I cannot connect with him. On the left hand, where he does work, but cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand. And I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. Eliphaz, you may not know, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. My foot has held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Praise the Lord. That's a man that knew the Lord. A man that faced the challenge and it was unconquerable in his heart. We're coming to chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 1. Moreover, Jew continued is parable and said, look at verse 3, all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. He said, let come what will. Anything that happens, Anything that does not happen. Here is my commitment. Here is my consecration. And I'm going to abide in that commitment and consecration to the very end. God will help you. God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. Till you die, you will not, you will not uh, remove your integrity your faithfulness, your holiness, and your conviction in Jesus' name. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. And did God say Job was wrong? Look at chapter 42. Job Chapter 42, reading verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the right sin. That, that which is right as my servant, my servant, my servant Job has. 
therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to who? My servant Job and offer up for yourselves a punch offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept. Him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly. All the things I was saying to God, they were foolishness. In that ye have not spoken of me the sin which is right like my servant Job. Verse 9. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shohite, and Zophar, the Nehemiah, Nehemiahite, went and did according to the commandment of the Lord as he commanded them. And the Lord, tell me, and the Lord also accepted Job. You see, there are friends. Friends, faithful or unfaithful. Friends, forceful or flattering. Friends, nice or nasty. Friends, innocent or ignorant. Friends, compelling or considerate. Friends, peaceful or passionate. Friends, tender or temperamental will not weaken your conviction. They come from whatever angle and they come from whatever attitude, with whatever attitude, nobody will weaken your conviction in Jesus' name. But you see, they are not only friends, there are foes. And foes, high or low. Foes, smiling or smiting. Foes, passive or pushful. Foes, tempting or trying. Foes, priestly or peasant. Foes, peaceful or pugnacious. Foes, friendly foe. Foes, flattering foe will not break your backbone. Once your backbone is broken, your spinal column is broken, you become like vegetable. You become helpless. You become an invalid. If you allow what foes and friends say to have total authority on you, you cannot pray by yourself again. You cannot decide the way to go by yourself again. You will lack the mind that can stand firm. You'll be worthless. You'll be useless. And you'll be of no value to the kingdom of God. Paralyzed and impotent, you will not be spineless in Jesus' name. Like Christ, like Paul, like Moses, like Elijah, like Daniel, like Peter, like the believers in the early church, you will stand firm. With faith and faithfulness, you will stand firm. With courage and conviction, you will stand firm. You see, this happens to ministers that you know people will try to come and by what they say and by what they preach and by what they counsel, they want to break your backbone and they want to break your conviction. Look at the Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 13. Philippians 1 verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all places. And then he goes on to say, and in all other places, 
in, in all the palace and all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord were seen confident by my bonds. I'm much more bold to speak the word without fear. You speak the word without fear. You preach the gospel without fear. You will emphasize the truth without fear. Everything you know, everything you have learned, without backing out, you will affirm confidently, fearlessly in Jesus' name. Look at that verse 14 again. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I will speak without fear. You will speak without fear. Look at this, look at this. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. And some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention. Not sincerely. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds. That's what Elipas came to do. In talking to Job. In preaching to Job. In telling Job visions and dreams. In condemning Job. He was talking to Job with contention, with insincerity, supposing to add affliction to his bonds. The other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Point number two is the defense of unconquerable ministers, though in misery. The defense, defense, you'll defend the gospel. I will defend the gospel. You'll not defend church, defend the gospel. You'll not defend denomination, defend the gospel. You'll not defend tradition, defend the gospel. You will not defend superstition, you will defend the gospel. I will defend the gospel. Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. How will you open your mouth? To make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak how boldly as I ought to speak. The Lord give us abundant grace. And we will speak boldly in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, reading from verses 3 and for Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And I entreat thee, true your fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with all my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. I know you are wondering what I'm reading. That's Philippians chapter 4. It's good to have an extra. I said it's good to have an extra. Let's come to Colossians now chapter 4. Reading from verse 3. Without praying also for us that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Make it manifest as I ought to speak. 
Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Point number three now. As I come to point number three, I want uh, our ministers from other churches to understand that my commitment is to keep to the word of God. And when you are not here, I'll preach the word. When you are here, I'll preach the word. And if I say anything in the word of God that you think, why should you say that? Understand, I have a commitment to the scriptures. And we're not going to tone down. We're not going to push aside. And we're not going to modify the word of God just because we have our fellow ministers from other churches who are here will keep to the word in Jesus' name. Christ has commanded, and we're going to keep to what he has commanded. We're coming back to Job, and I'm reading from chapter 17. Job, chapter 17, I read from verse 4. Job 17, verse 4. For thou hast hid their heart from understanding, therefore shalt thou not exalt them. That's Job talking. And he was talking about his friends that were counseling him. He said, I see you don't have the truth. I see you don't know the truth. And the Lord has hidden this from you, and it will not exalt where there is no truth. Look at verse 8. Upright men shall be astonished at this, and the innocent shall stand up himself against the hypocrite. The righteous also shall be bold, shall Hold on his way, and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. You'll be stronger and stronger. But as for you all, talking to his friends, do you return and come now, for I cannot find one wise man among you. I was talking to Elifas and talking to all those uh, people that came and were trying to tell him, you are wrong, you are wrong, you are sinful, you are a criminal. And he said, I cannot find the truth in your mouth. Look at chapter 32. Chapter 32 of Job. And I'm reading here from verse uh, 2. Chapter 32. We're looking at verse 2. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu. There's another man now that joined them, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram, against Job. Think about that. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. They were angry at Job. You will not mind anybody's anger. I can't hear your amen. You will not be afraid of anybody's fury. You will stand on the word of God all the days of your life in Jesus' name. Your friends might be angry at you. Your neighbors might be angry at you. And religious ministerial friends might be angry at you. But you will keep to the word of God. Think about this now. We've been preaching holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And we're almost getting to 50 years. And we've emphasized that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What do you think? If because we are now helping can 
Christian Association of Nigeria, and we are kind of doing some Bible study with them. Now we say, you know, we have to be careful now. We must not talk about sanctification anymore, Holy Ghost baptism anymore, and the distinct life of the believer anymore, so that we don't spoil our relationship. So, our commitment is no more to God, it's no more to Christ. Our commitment is now to those denominations so that we don't offend them. We'll never do that. I said we'll never do that. We don't want to offend anybody. We're not planning on offending anybody. But if the truth offends anybody, we have no choice. We'll keep on preaching the truth in Jesus' name. Eliphaz will not come from his denomination. Eliphaz will not come from his fellowship and ministry and twist our hand. And now we cannot preach what we know to be right. It will not happen. We're looking at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 15, verse 12, Then came the disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? When Jesus preached the truth, and the Pharisees were there, they were not willing to change. The Sadducees were there, they were not willing to have conversion. The religious traditionalists were there, and they were not willing to link up and connect with the truth that would change their lives. Jesus continued to preach the truth, and then the disciples came to him privately, and he said, Jesus, do you know that what you are saying and what you have said is offensive to those Pharisees? What did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, help me go and beg them? I didn't mean to do that. In the name of unity, I shouldn't have said that. In the name, in the pursuit of unity, I shouldn't preach what I heard from my father that I came to give unto the whole world. Go and help me tell them I'm sorry. Did Jesus say that? No, sir. He kept to the word. And I pray God will give you grace. You keep to the word in Jesus' name. And any of the ministers we allow to come on a Tuesday like this, if they also want to get to heaven, if there's any tradition in their hand, if there's anything that is not of God in their hands, they'll repent, they'll drop it, and then we can have true fellowship. If they don't, we don't have fellowship with darkness. Look at verse 14. Let them alone. That's what Jesus said. Let them alone. I'm coming back to verse uh, coming back to verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted, tell me, shall be rooted up. You don't want to be putting manure on what God wants to approach. You don't want to be putting fertilizer on what God wants to approach. It says every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up let them alone they be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind what will happen both shall fall into the ditch point number three the divine demand against unequal yoke in his mandate the divine demand against an equal yoke in his mandate. The Lord wants us to serve in the right way. Preach the word and not hide the truth. Half gospel is false gospel. Half gospel will not save. And so don't say that because we are coming together, this is unity and this is understanding and this is fellowship. 
then we withhold the truth then we don't want people to get saved we're not going to get united with any group of people to the point we're silent on the truth of the word of god give me a good good amen, amen. look at second corinthians chapter six second corinthians chapter six i'm reading from verse 14 be ye not unequally yoked together with some believers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? If anybody remains in occultic blindness and, and darkness, anybody remains in the darkness of tradition that does not save, we're not going to cooperate with such people. We're going to cooperate only with the people that want the light, want to come into the light, and want to abide in the light. In verse 15, what concord has Christ's rebellion? Or what part has see the believer with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them i will be their god and they shall be my people wherefore tell me somebody there say it aloud that's what the lord said wherefore come out from among them that means don't support tradition don't support falsehood don't support false doctrine don't support churchianity without Christ. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Are you offended? Are you angry? No, that's the word of God. Can you imagine Jesus Christ being unequally yoked together with Pharisees in the name of unity? Never. Can you imagine Moses being unequally yoked together with the magicians of Egypt? Never. Moses didn't say, if we unite with um, the magicians of Egypt, they have rods, we have a rod. We throw it down, it becomes a serpent. They throw theirs down, it becomes a serpent. And our own bigger serpent swallowed up their serpent. Now they understand, okay, let's come together. Moses and the magicians of Egypt will not form an unequal alliance to say they are doing anything for God. Can you imagine Elijah coming into an equal yoke with prophets of Baal? It will not have happened. Can you imagine Daniel in Babylon coming into an equal yoke with the astrologers of Babylon? Never. How about Peter and Simon, the sorcerer, Simon of Samaria? Okay, you are Simon. I'm Simon too. Let's come together. No, it will not happen. We are going to other churches and we're trying to help other churches so that they'll be united on the truth, not united on error, not united on false doctrine. We're not putting any stamp of approval on any tradition on any superstition, on what is unbiblical, unscriptural, Jesus will not do it. Followers of Jesus will not do it. John, the beloved, an apostle of love, he said there are many deceivers and he called them antichrist. Can you imagine any of those apostles remaining with, you know, all those people, they are not changing their understanding. They're still superstitious, they're still traditional, and they don't want ever to change anything. They want to be serving the way they are serving, and they want to believe error the way they believe error. And then John will say, okay, it doesn't really matter. In the name of unity, let us come together. And whatever we're saying that, uh, you know, you don't like, will drop it will not drop anything from the Bible. We will we'll stand on everything we have always believed in Jesus' name. 
What did the Lord say? The Lord said, come out from among them. We will. I said, we will. We have the truth. I'm allowed to preach the truth. I'll keep on going, keep on going. But if I have to keep quiet, not talk, not talk on holiness, not talk on the rapture, and not talk on how to prepare for the coming of the Lord, then we're out, we're not in. I didn't hear your amen. amen. Jeremiah chapter 51. In Jeremiah chapter 51, I'm reading from verse 45. My people, go ye out of the midst of her. And deliver ye every man a soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. If we remain in Babylonish occultism and Babylonish tradition and Babylonish false doctrine, the anger of the Lord will be upon us. But we will escape. Revelation chapter 18, reading from verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The word of God is clear. And what the word of God has stated and outlined, that we will do. I'll be obedient to the world. I said I'll be obedient to the world. To the world. The age of the age is about here. We're now at the last hours of the last day of this epoch. And Christ is about to come. And the word of God says before his coming, there'll be a falling away. People will fall away from the truth. And that they will have itching ears. They will not want to hear the truth. And only those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This is not the day or the time to compromise the truth. This is the time to re-examine our lives. And to reaffirm a consecration and not allow any lifers to bring any dream, any vision, any falsehood. And then the whole church sways off and we cannot stand anymore. We will stand. I know I will stand. I said I will stand. Job chapter 34. I'm reading from verses 31. And 32, Job 34, verses 31 and 32. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, tell me. I will do no more. This is what every believer ought to say. Any believer in the house today? Where are you? Read this with me. Verse 31, verse 32, 1, 2, 3, go. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Now let's see it for the church, Deeper Life Bible Church, verse 31, verse 32, 1, 2, 3, go. Amen. Now you are going to say it for your pastor for the years. One, two, three, go.
what that means is if we have taken thank you if we have taken any decision that makes us to go away from the word of god our commitment is now that we know if whatever decision we took is wrong and it's going to lead us to compromise it's going to lead us to being quiet on the truth it's going to make us to intermingle to the point that we cannot stand on what we ought to stand on beginning from me to the whole of the church at the headquarters and to all the branches of deeper life in Nigeria, Africa, and beyond, anywhere and everywhere. Our prayer is that which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity in taking any decision, I will do no more. Give a good day. Amen. Amen. Rise up and let's take the word of the Lord to him in prayer don't be offended at the word of god take the word to the lord in prayer if you've done iniquity if you've gone astray if you are compromising if you are being silent on the truth if you cannot firmly wholeheartedly stand on the word of god anymore because you have an agreement a league a fellowship with some people and you cannot stand anymore pray to the lord and say lord i come back to the center of the word i will do no more iniquity